So I'm speaking to Simon and Stephen from uh, Flytrap. Could you just uh, congratulations on your nominations? Thank you. If you could just introduce yourself to 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 um, to the camera, um, let us know what your role is in the whole film, um, and then we can go from there. Or how you connected to the film? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, Stephen David Brooks, director, writer, editor. Yada yada yada. A few other a few other hats. It's the list is endless. Well, I did look on. It's on not it. endless, but it's long. Yeah, I mean, connection with the film is incredible. Yeah. He's oh. involved in everything, don't right? you? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, my name's Simon Boswell. I'm the composer of the uh, original music in the movie. Okay, thank you. Um, it's always pretty much the same question, and this is like, personally, where did the idea come from? How did how did this originate? Because it is quite unusual. And I, I mentioned this. What well, well, I'm quite fusion. unusual, yeah, like you, as you will begin to see, yes. <laughs> um, well, it came from a notion, and it's in the opening voiceover, it came from this notion of paranoia, of do we really know the people in our lives, our friends, our neighbors, do we know what they're capable of, do we know what they're really thinking? And it comes from the idea that are we paranoid to think that there's something off or is there something really off with some of these people so you've got this idea in your head and then i'm, I'm assuming it's germinating and it's turning into something else over a period of how, how long did it from that thought to actually putting pen to paper uh well the original screenplay which was actually a mega budget uh spec screenplay was f 15 years ago oh right and I put it away for a while and then stumbled across the money in New York and did it. I mean, I, I, I've never really got too much involved in asking films about money. It's, it always seems a little bit personal and I just, but it always intrigues me how, because everyone has different ways of doing it. I've heard horror stories, nightmare stories. And how did, how did that happen? How did you go about actually raising the finance? I, mean, uh, I know you said you stumbled over it, but. Yes, well, I did sort of stumble over it. I. Uh, one day was having, I, I did it, I concocted something I called the evil plan, which I had decided two and a half years ago, I wasn't going to write anything I couldn't just go shoot. Because it's so difficult to get together one, two, five, ten million dollars to make a film, mm -hmm. I thought I'm just going to start going low budget and just write and shoot. So I wrote a short called Binky, played, shot it, played festivals, won some awards, yeah. and people would ask me, what are you going to do next? Yeah. And I would just say, flytrap. I don't know why I said that, but I said it. And two months after, actually after Binky was completed, I was in Manhattan having a drink with a lawyer friend of mine. And he said, you know, a friend, uh, a friend and I want to invest in a film. Um, do you know of anything? Do you know of any films? And I said, well, actually, yes, I have this thing called Flytrap. He goes, oh, tell me about it. I told him about it, and as often it happens in life, you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, you bang your head against the wall, and all of a sudden the wall crumbles. He talked to his friend. Within a month, I had the LLC form. That's like the company to right. make the film. <clears throat> the money was in the bank, and we were shooting three months later. And it was that quick? It was that quick. Wow. Yeah, that's why I say it was, a, it was one long stumble. That's, I've not, never heard of a, I mean, I've heard lots of stories, yeah, yeah. but never, yeah. never one like that. It's quite incredible. Yeah, I know. It, and yeah, I think, I mean, when you're open to the possibilities of what can happen, what people can do, what the universe can give you, when you're just sort of open and willing to accept, stuff comes your way. Yeah, that's really quite fortunate. Right place, right time. Trust me, I, I feel very fortunate, yeah, yes. <laughs> and how did you bring Simon to I me? Mean, what was your connection with Simon? Because I, I should say, I've, I've obviously yeah. looked at IMDb, and you all, both your CVs are yeah. like a mile long, yeah. and there's a lot of stuff in there that I, I recognise and I've seen. So how did that well, happen? Well, it, it's actually funny. A little bit disturbing, but somewhat funny. I've stalked, I mean, <laughs> pursued Simon for about 15 years. Um, I remember seeing uh, in the early 90s, it must have been 1990, this extraordinary film uh, called Hardware that Richard Stanley directed. Mm -hmm got a theatrical release in the US. And there's this opening score that's orchestral, but there's this beautiful slide guitar melody. And I thought, wow, who did that? And then I read, oh, Simon Boswell, well, this guy's good. Then, weirdly enough, 
Um, I had a movie that I wrote called The Mangler three or four years later, and we were screening it at Disney, mm. and Richard Stanley was in town with a, his print, his cut of his next film, Dust Devil. And we screened it, and then I heard the Dust Devil score. Still to my, honestly, to this day, my favorite score. And I thought, I thought to myself that day in 19, must have been 93, I'm gonna have Simon score a movie for me one day. It took until 2015, but you know. And then ultimately what happened was we connected on Facebook. He's good friends with a friend of mine, a brilliant writer director named Paul Chart, hmm. who's from London but lives in LA. And we connected, and one day I saw that on Facebook, we, Simon and I connected, and one day he said he was going to be in L.A. for a couple of days, and I met him. We hit it off, and... We had a nice uh, pot of tea. Yes, we did, we? yes. Uh, Pro proper that, English tea. That, that in Los say. Angeles. It's, it's always the tea. It's the tea that <laughs> yeah. gets the English. Yeah. <laughs> so how, how on earth do you envisage something that's not, not real? I mean, I, 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 I guess you're being pitched about a film, you're trying to explain what you want to do this thing. I mean, this is, I, I don't know, this is me surmising. So how on earth do you go about creating, because there's, there's nothing organic, is there's nothing to, I'm tr what I'm trying to say badly is, the creation process of, of a score must be so hard because you're working against, I assume, a script or a pitch or visualization or storyboards, well, I don't know. If you're asking how does the film score come about? Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. I mean, it, it, this is the same with almost all movies, which is that usually it, we wait until it's shot and I have something I can look at, yeah. uh, you know, ideally edited too, so I know exactly what happens where, and I write the music to that picture. That's the way it came about with this too. It's a, it's a normal process. I have done movies. If you, I thought you were maybe asking the question, how did he persuade me to do it? But I, well, you know, T. I think it's was, I, it was T. Well, I, I, um, I, I operate very much on the kind of the basis that the universe sort of brings you in touch with people, and it sort of things happen for a reason. That's what I think, and I, and it very much was like that meeting uh, Stephen. He was, you know just so enthusiastic and nice and we had a nice cup of tea and I thought, yes, I'll do your film. This is before he'd actually shot it. And then yeah. when he shot it, he sent it to me and of course I, I could write the music to the picture. So there's never a moment where you're um, composing the music even before you've seen a frame? It does happen. Yeah, right. It's rare. It does happen. There's a few movies I've done that way around. But no, normally the process is, you know, the music comes after they've actually shot the, uh, the film. So once you're seeing a rough cut or you, you send a print or whatever, yeah. then you're, uh, is it an immediate process or I mean? For me it yeah. is. I take a lot, I mean, I, I, for me what's really important is that something is, is very close to being a, a finished edit because I first of all get the pace, you know, mm. of, of the music from the way it's edited. You know, that's a very important first step for me. Uh, and then I simply react to it like the pianist at a silent movie. I mean, I, I watch it and, uh, I will sit on a uh, keyboard and it just comes out through my hands. And I very often trust my first instinct with things too. Because I'm, for my first instinct is the same as a, the, an audience member, you know. And I think it's important to do that. I mean, I can't, it's, it's very difficult for me to, to relate to how you can suddenly be presented with this, but then this is what you do, of course, and this is your profession. And then suddenly the music comes to life as you're watching this moving film. And it's all flowing. I it's manipulate hard. people emotionally. Well, I mean, it, I just, it's very <laughs> it's difficult for, to, to understand how well, such a creative you know. thing. It's I mean, it's, well, filmmaking is creative, which well, I actually imagine. Right, well, it's actually it's a very complicated process, actually. I mean, from my perspective, and this is what Simon is so brilliant at, is the score has to fit the film. Yeah. It can't overwhelm the film. It can't underwhelm. It needs to enhance the film so that you actually don't notice it. It's like great sound effects editing, great editing. You don't notice the cuts. Well, you don't notice the score, but you feel the score. Mm. And, and getting back to the point of whether Simon or another composer would come in, at, at what point they come in, it really needs to be when the picture is locked because, especially with Simon, he always puts in these little accents, like a triangle or a bell hit or one note, and it needs to be exactly to the frame of that emotional moment in the film. Ideally. Ideally. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, though, and this has come about, you know, I mean, I've been doing this quite a long time, now everything's gotten digital. Editing 
is so much easier for people to do. There, are, there almost seems to be no such thing as a locked film. We're getting quite deep into Lock ish is oh, the I term. See, right. Because, right. because, yes. because yeah, people change it yeah, all yeah. the time. It used to be, you know, when it was on analog, you know, on, on magnetic tape, yeah. um, it, usually a lock meant lock because it was quite a business to kind of go and change yeah. stuff. Uh, but I think you know composers have to be a, uh, move at the times and be able to adjust what they're doing. But I, I don't like adjusting it because, like I said, I do trust my first response to something, and you can spend more time trying to adjust something than write it afresh, as it were. So you know. Anyway, but the, th the simple fact is, if you're inspired by something, yeah. then it's for me. It's not a job. It's really logical easy thing to do i just respond to it and his film's really good so you know it's that's the, that's the way it works well i did i did i was quite honest i haven't seen it i've only seen parts of it and uh, uh, i haven't seen all of it either so <laughs> <laughs> you're the tree and uh, was it um was it more difficult to shoot than you you thought was it or you know in hindsight was it um well that's the reality smoother, i suppose uh, that applies to everything that's ever been shot it is always more difficult than you expect. Yeah. It is always, and after the fact, there's always something you go, oh, why didn't I think of that? That's just the process. Especially Apocalypse Now. <laughs> there's a That's, prime example. Yeah, as yes. a prime example, <laughs> yes. There's actually a couple of filmmakers that I've spoken to, and I said to them, when you hear the story, I said to them, you should make a film of that film, of making the film, because often the... Uh, it's actually been done. It's oh, actually yeah, been yeah. A, there's a There's actually a brilliant film called Living in Oblivion, um, which is about a micro-budget movie about making a micro-budget movie that's just absolutely has every single problem that ever goes wrong on every micro-budget movie is in that. It's brilliant. And how long did it take to shoot? Because what was the, the time? Twelve days. Twelve days. Right, that's pretty... Okay. Tell me about it, and yes. Then, <laughs> and then post. I know obviously that includes all the music and everything, but right. how long was the post? In post for one year. Oh, right, okay. So that's quite... But is that... Was that a year a year to be expected? Was that were you breaking that up into segments because you were doing other projects, or you? Uh, no, I can't it, imagine you working that. It's a, in a it's year. a year because mainly most of that was the time it took me to edit, and I'm a very slow editor. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically, I don't know the keyboard shortcuts and so on. Creatively, I'm fast, but it, my fingers cannot keep up with my brain, so it takes me a while to get a cut done. And quite often, in fact, pretty much every time I've spoken to filmmakers, I've worn spun lots of plates, wore, wore multiple hats. When I've asked about doing the editing, they've often said that they wish they hadn't done the editing. Is that, is that true in your... Because it's difficult, I think, to be um, object, objective when it's your baby, because I suppose cutting it must be really painful, and I guess you went for the same Well, place. actually, I'm, no, I'm very good at that. I mean, I'm a writer and a director who is not possessive of any particular moment. If the moment doesn't work, it's gone, or I adjust it. My only thing is, for budgetary reasons, I cut this film. I will never do that again. I'm hiring an editor. It's another right. creative voice. What the, the brilliant thing about a creative editor is someone who is not on set didn't care how long it took you to get that shot. Yes. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But also, it's a fresh set of eyes that may look at a scene and say, you know, that entrance should be in the middle of the scene, not the end of the scene. And they will, they'll rearrange it in a way that the screenwriter-director might not conceive of and yeah. oftentimes <clears throat> it works better and so that's it it's definitely and someone else do the editing because i know you've got a load of films again i've looked and there's quite a few in the pipeline I think you've got yes a few out. things in the pipeline and i promise you they will all have editors <laughs> who are not me <laughs> but they will have simon doing the score <laughs> yeah. there it's on tape so. it's official <laughs> and uh, the the premise is it's a science fiction film pretty much isn't it? I mean, that's the premise is, is that your your main theme for all your films or is it just a one-off for me the the, the idea comes first right. and then i choose once the idea is fully uh, fully germinated and i have the premise line and i know what it's about i understand the thematic elements then it, i have to think about what is the genre the story tells me what the genre is going to be mm -hmm. in this case it was obviously you've seen some yeah, of it yeah. obviously science fiction yeah, yeah. what I call soft science fiction because the science fiction element is somewhat hidden until the end but so the genre comes from the story I've written horror I've written fantasy I've written somewhat twisted love stories I mean I've written things and the idea tells me what to do and is there a genre that you haven't tried that you'd like to try 
in filmmaking, obviously. You know, maybe you haven't done a rom-com. But seriously, there might be something you haven't done that you'd, you'd like to do. Yeah, um, I would love to do a space epic. Right. I mean, I, I would love to do something like 2001, some sort of ambiguous, ambitious, visual feast. Psychedelic. Psychedelic, Psychedelic. exactly, yeah. Maybe it'll be my first VR film. Oh, we should talk about that. There we you should go. talk about that. Oh, yeah, yes, there you I go. Okay. Thursday. So are you working again on the next? Is, is there something coming No, well, on? as of 30 seconds ago, I guess yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's actually exciting. <laughs> I'm going to a VR conference that VR Simon thing. is I've speaking. Got I, 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 yes, yes. I've got involved quite heavily in, in, in VR recently. Um, in fact, made, made, this, made an app. with. I have a band that performs sort of psychedelic versions of, of yeah. um, yeah. my film scores right. with, with a pretty psychedelic video backdrop um, but we through the various people that I met we decided to make an app also based around the fact that I made a track with Timothy Leary the 60s acid oh, really? before he died yeah in the 90s yeah um, it was a very strange thing where well, I was living in LA at the time and I met an Italian astrophysicist who had sampled sounds from deep space. I want space. to live your life. This sounds fascinating. <laughs> yeah, anyway, but, and, and she, she had sampled these sounds of deep space. And uh, my agent put me in touch with her because he said, you know, uh, maybe you could do something with it, make music, you know, do tracks. Right, so right. I, I turned them into the musical things and worked with her. And she said, oh, I've met this guy called Timothy Leary who's, who's really into space and uh, he wants to do a, tr a track with us. So we made this track together. So anyway, so... On the basis of that, we, we've done a thing with Google, Google Cardboard, who make these things called Google Cardboard. So you put your smartphone in, right. and it splits the image, so you get a 360-degree virtual surround um, environment. Uh, because no. we, we saw something today, which I hadn't seen before, apparently it's been out a while, where there's this guy, he's in an airplane, the camera's on him, but you can move it and look anywhere, and it, it's yeah. something up, apparently it's been out for a while now. Yeah. And, and you could, but well, you've obviously seen, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the way that... Well, I, I, it's, it's a big hot thing. Yeah, and I, was, and I suppose you're changing for filmmaking, that it must be. Yeah, I'm slightly concerned about it, because I, don't, I actually don't think it's, it's... I don't think it's that good. I mean, I've been to lots of these VR conferences, and I find it, apart from that, I was nearly sick a couple of times uh, with the headsets what, the way, on. Right, just okay. to think, you're just like being taken on rides and things, uh, uh, you know, virtually. I don't think it's very good for storytelling. At all, uh, you know, it's it's much more about the popcorn, you know, experience of it, and I think they might incorporate it. I think into into movies like Star Wars, we could benefit from moments when you were in a completely surrounded right. experience. But it doesn't help your storytelling at all, and I think it's a long way to go with all that. I think I think what it's going to take, just like you know, a, a platform needs the killer app. I think VR is going to need the killer story. I mean, I tr actually tried the Hack the Planet app with my. I, for, I didn't bring my Google Cardboard. I may have to get another copy for Thursday. But, but it's the, the idea of being telling a story where, as opposed to the filmmaker telling you where to look, mm. or a stage production where you decide where to look, but you're still seeing the entire stage, is the ability to go, oh, this character is interesting. Yeah. Oh, what is this character over there thinking, even though they're not talking? The ability to sort of pick and choose as an audience, what to look at has potential. Yeah. It's sort of potential, but it turns the whole uh, film make, film, the hundred years of film make, filmmaking on its head. Well, as a, a director, I hate the fact that exactly. I, I wouldn't have control. Exactly. Yes, of course. Yeah, but you're, you're, so it's a very yeah. random, it becomes right. a sort of random, more democratized thing in a way, which I'm not sure is good when, it, when democracy comes down to people voting for X factor and shit, in my opinion. It's not a good thing. But don't worry, you'll be <laughs> well, voting with well, well, the EU soon. Well, I I, well, you get a vote, you know you have Well, I'm an American, and democracy is always good. <laughs> Especially when you're an independent billionaire. <laughs> no comment. Dodgy, you. With a very dodgy wig, yeah. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Listen, guys, thank you very much for your time. All right, no, thank, thank you. You're welcome. Perfect. Thank really you. Nice to meet thank you. you. So begins my story. It started off easy enough. Landed at JFK and decided to drive cross-country to Los Angeles for a new teaching job in the astronomy department at UCLA. 
it all started to happen on an otherwise normal Friday afternoon. We're all trapped, you know. We're trapped from the moment we're conceived. Trapped in our mother's womb, trapped by our parents' wishes, trapped by what we're taught in school, by what we're told to believe, trapped by fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what will be. Fear of the wrath of some unknown or invisible God. Or worse yet, that nagging fear that once you're gone, you're gone forever. I've read about the goings-on in Los Angeles. What are you? Some kind of strange religious cult? Screwing night and day to precipitate the end of man? Yes. That is what we want, the end of man. What are you going to do to me? Huh? You're going to fill it, mate. Enjoy me with some fava beans and a nice candy. If that's okay. 